Good afternoon, friends. Hi, I'm back. It is What Up Wednesday, and uh, things are a little chaotic, I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm living very dangerously today. Let me tell you about this. I decided to book a lash appointment, and one hour ago, I was getting my lashes done. I know, I'm crazy. What was I doing? Even crazier. No, no, no. Just get this. Five minutes ago, I was eating peanut butter toast. I know, what am I thinking? I had it on my face, I had it in my teeth. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. So, <clears throat> just so you know, those are probably decisions I'm never gonna make again. At least if I'm smart, I will never make those decisions again. Now let's see if I can turn off all my notifications because this is going to drive me crazy if this keeps going. I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, I keep in touch with a lot of people around the world and I read a lot of news and it looks like there's some people who are able to get into back into hockey which is really really exciting and extremely jealous see uh, enthusing generating <laughs> and then there's other districts in the world like ours where in Canada here we are not back to hockey uh, we're having problems with insurance so they're they're making progress but things are looking really expensive so let me know what's going on with you guys are you back to hockey how are things in your world we are going to get started with some questions and answers very very soon so I would love to hear from you who's here who's on all that kind of stuff okay so I am I have a series of questions that people have been throwing at me for the last week which is awesome I have no idea if I'm going to get to them all I have no idea if I'm going to try to get to them all because I didn't want to make this a two-hour escapade you guys were extremely patient throughout all the Empire Home episodes and I decided that with everybody's lives returning a bit back to normal maybe two hours was a bit much to ask <laughs> So I'm trying, I, I didn't want to set a limitation because I have no idea how long this is going to take, but I figure maybe 45 minutes. What do you say? Uh, let me know if you think 45 minutes, half an hour. Let's, let's see, let's find out. Let me know what you would like to have. Martin Stoneman, good to see you as always. Remember, you bring those jokes. I need them today because I'm, ooh, I'm a little scrambled. Stain, good morning, good afternoon, great to see you. Uh, Simon, you're not back yet to hockey in Surrey, but hello. Good to see you as always, Simon. Liam, great. Hi, buddy, good to see you. And the Zaccanini family, my favorites, not gonna lie. Love those, love those folk. Good to see everybody though. So, sorry, I'm rearranging my, my beverages. I was watching some Umpire and Homes back and I noticed that I do drink a lot and I think that's just nerves. I'm really not that thirsty. I'm just nervous. So let's see if I can keep it down to a regular level today. I have no idea if that's gonna happen. Okay, so I think I'm gonna try to get started with some questions that were thrown at me, but if you want to throw anything into the mix, you have some of your own ideas, you have some feedback for me, you wanna massively disagree like Martin Stoneman likes to do, do to me on Twitter. Um, if you have your own question that you would like to see if I can get to today, I'm game. Like, let's, let's see what we got here. And I'm gonna try, some, because it's really important that you try new technology when you do something new for the first time. So I'm gonna try this iPad split shot thing so I can show you guys the questions and show you the rules and basically show you a lot of mistakes on my end. It could be scary. So please bear with me. I hope the sound is good. I did some testing, so I hope things are okay. And yeah, let's see what we got here, folks. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the first question that I've got. Whew, look at that. And it sort of works. So over, the music is a bit loud. Well, it just ended, so that's the good news. <laughs> and I will actually turn that right off now. So thanks, Stan, appreciate that. So a gentleman going by, uh, or a person going by Vlados2927 on Instagram asked me, is it possible to defend in a face mask, a PC, 
around the circle. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, that our friend here uh, was going for brevity and also maybe a little bit of, of a different English uh, thing going on. So I think what he's asking is whether you can be wearing a face mask when you're outside the circle on a penalty corner. Martin, quiet. Don't interrupt me at this moment. Um, so can you wear a face mask when you're outside the circle defending a penalty? A penalty corner. So the first thing to keep in mind, friends at home, is that actually when the ball was outside the circle, if it has gone more than five meters outside the circle, the penalty corner is over. So you're not defending a penalty corner anymore. So that's the first thing. Okay. But uh, that little smart alecky comment aside, the general rule is that safety is the guiding principle. Like we're not here to be jerks about this one necessarily, but there's not just the safety of the defenders who are defending the penalty corner at the time to worry about. It's also the safety of the other participants in the game, the field players. And a player who's running about the pitch with a mask on can present a possible danger to other players with the activities that you would see more often out there with close angle uh, tackle attempts and things like that. So that's the rationale under which we don't want to see players uh, necessarily running around with uh, face masks on everywhere. Now, this is this is five. Uh, sorry, four point three sub e. Uh, just the all the italics around the guide. Actually, I think that's that's guidance that's still subclause. Very confusing. So you'll know that players, if they have a medical reason, like they've broken bones in their face and they need to wear extra protection, like, for example, when Kate Richardson Walsh did so um, at in the Olympics in 2012. Um, and we've we've had a few Canadian players who have needed to do that. Gordy Johnston had to do it a couple of years ago for Canada. Um, in that case, the overriding principle is okay, like there is a risk there for the other players, but we're going to worry more about that player's ability to participate. So, hi, Valley, great to see you. Um, so, but generally, what we're looking for is the players to discard the masks as soon as practically possible after they have left the circle. Okay, so one of the exceptions here um, that we talk about when you look at the rule is that let me turn on the markup, is that uh, including the immediate taking of the free hit awarded after penalty corner when passing the ball to another player. So this is a this is a rule change that, or a change to the rules that came in 2019 uh, rule book so that they made it explicit. It's okay, because technically, as soon as a free hit is awarded to the defense in that situation, that is one of the conditions that ends a penalty corner. But... We wanted to say, okay, it's quite reasonable that in order to not have this technicality stop a fast break, if the player who's on the ball outlets the ball immediately to another player, despite the fact corner's over, that's cool. All right, so we've got that as well. Um, and then looking at this last part of the clause, so the general wearing of face masks, we should be allowing it to be consistent with the underlying spirit of this guidance. So... What you want to be doing as an umpire with face max is as a player is dribbling towards the edge of the circle, your beep, spidey sense turns on. And then as soon as they get to the edge of the circle, you want to be proactively instructing the player. Hey, mask off, mask off, mask off as best you can. Okay. And within, I mean, if they're getting close to the 23, they're going too far. Um, and that is when they are gaining an advantage at the risk of other players, so you need to give that a stop. What is the foul that you would call in that situation? Hey, Jade, great to see you. Alistair, I'm going to get to your question soon. Robert, good to see you. What is the foul that you call in this situation? Spoiler alert, it's a free hit. Okay, now you might say, well, they're clearly intending to keep that mask on, so, you know, it should be another penalty corner. No, 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 let's not go there. This is a pretty technical, absolutish rule that doesn't actually cause a disadvantage to the other team. 
Like it doesn't take the ability for them to have a pretty good scoring opportunity on goal. So if that's not what's being taken away, is that what we're going to grant as an award? It doesn't, doesn't jive the scales of justice as I've tried to trademark do not balance. So it's just a free hit. If the player or the players on one team are repeatedly engaging this behavior and you think it might be a delay tactic or whatever the case might be, then you might move to a card. Then you get in the difficult situation where the FIH is instructed under the 2020 uh, revised briefing that any personal penalty within the 23 has to be accompanied with the upgraded team penalty. I hate that. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I hate that. I think it's dumb. I think it removes discretion and valuable management tools away from umpires. And it's not supported under the rules when you read them. So I don't like it. And so you would have to think very carefully there. If that is the strict interpretation that's being applied in your area, whether you want to be giving a, a card in a penalty corner for that, I think you want to do everything you can to avoid that situation. It's just a free hit. So just go with that. So I hope that answers all of the questions there. Uh, Alistair's following up here. What if the ball hits a discarded match on the pitch? Well, Alistair, let me go to the tape. Let me go to the rules. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Now, I think it's probably not in here. It's probably in the penalty corner rules. Whoops, goes too far. This was explicitly added in the rules. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask all of you at home to go tell me where that rule is because I'm just gonna fumble around here and leave awkward silence on this live broadcast. So I want you guys to go to your rule books and I want you to dig that out for me. But they have made it explicit that another penalty corner is to be awarded if it, the ball hits a discarded mat mask on the pitch inside the circle, obviously. If it if the mask is outside the circle, then you're looking at a free hit. Yeah, I don't know where exactly where it is. So you guys have all fallen very silent, which is great, which means you're all searching for this. I love it. Okay, so we'll come, we'll circle back. It's like, a, it's like a Zoom meeting. We're gonna circle back to that. Great, let's put it on the agenda. And let's move on to the next question. And this came from a longtime friend of FH Empires, Ian James Parsley. He it does a lot of really interesting writing comparing um, football to hockey, which I think if you cared at all about football, you would think was really, really interesting. Um, so I do read it so that I can learn a little bit about football, but I actually don't care that much about it. 916, William, nailed it. Cookie for you. We're going to circle back right now before I forget. So we're going to go to 916 and we're going to find it. There it is. Following a penalty corner, if the ball hits any discarded equipment, a free hit should be awarded if this occurs outside the circle and a penalty corner award if it's inside the circle. Nice. Mike D, you've got something else. 12.4B. Oops. Let's go have a look at that. Let's, let's go have a look at that. 12.4B. That looks like a penalty stroke rule. So we'll come back to that, Mike. You can uh, tell me what it is about that that caught your eye and why you wanted to bring it into this part of the conversation. But uh, always uh, an interesting one. You're deeming that face mask discarding action as intentional. Harsh, sir. Quite harsh. But it is possible. Okay, let's go back to Ian's uh, question, which is really good. And these are the kind of questions that I like to ask, ways to apply the rules, and then sort of techniques and tactics and skills that aren't necessarily rules-based are kind of the things that would be really great to have a chance to talk about here on What's App Wednesday. And uh, so Ian is asking, here it is, um, what is one tip that I would give for successful cooperation with a co-umpire? And uh, this is great. 
Uh, I have obviously lots of tips that could go along with this, but the one thing that I really learned and got really driven into my consciousness when I did all the umpire at home interviews is how the theme of communication came up over and over and over again. So in addition to communicating with players and communicating with coaches, as we learned on that series, communicating with your colleague obviously is going to be the, the, uh, the best way to develop that relationship that's going to turn into your mutual and cooperative performance on the field. So the best way you can start out with that is to start with a pre-match chat. And for those of you who have been umpiring for a few days, for a hot minute, pre-match chats can get really, really boring. I have probably done over a thousand of them in my lifetime, I'm guessing. And it can get really hard to be creative or try to say something new or something like that. But even in the struggle of trying to find something new to say to somebody, perhaps who you've been umpiring with several times before, gives you an opportunity to maybe get creative about some scenarios that you are uh, like, hey, what would we do if an alien landed on the pitch? You know, okay, that's a little crazy, but getting uh, into, into the weeds, as it were, the way that you guys do all the time to me on, uh, the Facebook discussions is, is a great way just to have that exchange. You, when you're working with somebody new, obviously you want to cover the basics and I'll go into that in a second, but that exchange of information can, it's just like, it's like an, having insurance. Nobody likes insurance. It's really boring, but it's super useful to have when things go wrong. So I find it's a way that you cover off those things and then you only have a more limited amount of things that can go wrong later. So think of it that way. Now for a pre-match chat, uh, these are the kind of things that you wanna look at. Now, let's be real here. A lot of us rock up to games with even a new colleague and maybe we've just played and we've got literally five minutes to whip off our shin guards, get on a different colored shirt, if we're really dedicated, get something black on the bottom halves of us and find our whistles, find our cards and get our watch back on and get ready to umpire. So it can be really, um, really difficult to um, get through a whole uh, thorough pre-match chat. So I consider it like a triage. So what you want to do is you want to get to as many of these things as you can. And for me, this is an uh, order of not importance, but desperation, literally. Is this going to save your life on the field as a, as a team? So talk about your, your uh, sides, who wants the table, who wants the spectators, if that's a thing, or whatever the case might be. You might be in, in uh, Calgary here. Our table side is the same as the spectator side. So you go to the other side and you're in your own little world. It's beautiful. Sometimes there's shade over there with the trees and it can be really nice, but you often have the sun in your eyes. So I usually take the, uh, the, the action side because I hate the sun. Areas of responsibility, really important. Um, you can see that this might be my indoor uh, pre-match chat here because it's talking about boards um, towards the way is circle but all these things how are you going to split up the pitch and I have a pre-match chat card that uh, you can go download if you go to fhumpires.com forward slash chat uh, you can and I'll put that right here in the um, comments fhumpires.com forward slash chat Hopefully that's not my indoor version, but if it is, come back and complain and I'll get you the outdoor version. Um, you can download that and it's also got, it's, it's got a pitch diagram on one side. You fold it in half, laminate it if you're super keen. For me, I would, I just always use iPads and things like that because I'm a nerd. Um, use a whiteboard. A, a pitch with the, the dry erase markers, things like that, whatever you need to do. But it can be really helpful to draw the pictures as to how you guys would like to split up the responsibilities on the pitch. And then how are you going to signal cooperation? So for me, these top three are the things you can get this done in 
45 seconds, maybe one minute, and they're crucial. And especially the cooperation part, how and when are you gonna look for help? When do you want your colleague to be giving you signals on penalty corners? What do you do if you see something in your colleague's circle that they didn't and you have a stop time situation or a stop play situation and you're able to send them a nonverbal message? If you have radios, how are you going to incorporate those into the way that you're communicating? What do you do if, when the radios crap out on you? That, those sort of things. Covering those things off are really crucial. And then if you're able to go down through these other things, if you're in a more of a tournament situation or you have 15 minutes for a pre-match chat, you can start talking about how you're going to handle uh, making sure you're on the same page with raised balls, drillings, drillings obviously indoor, and other interpretations, um, how you're going to go through management. How are you going to touch base with your management interventions and make sure that you are understanding each other's uh, steps that you're taking, uh, where you're going to be on penalty corners, penalty strokes, when the ball is in the deep opposite corner and that sort of thing. Um, timing signals, timing in and out. Um, maybe if you're working with a tech table, going through some technical things like that, uh, water systems. Um, maybe if there's camera people that you have to deal with, because we're all very famous and we're doing very high level matches. This is more gonna be like, how are you gonna deal with that one person's dog who's watching the game from outside the fence? It's gonna be, it's gonna be more like that. You might want to talk about the character and temper of the game and if there's any history to take into account. Now, you're gonna be careful about this because I'm not talking about this team always fouls like this. What I am, thinking that it could be valuable to draw attention to is the last time these two teams played, they got in a fight. <laughs> Knowing that kind of background can be vital for you going into a match. How are we going to handle the tempers that are possibly going to be presented? How are we going to make sure that doesn't happen in our game? How are we going to make sure this game is going to be as fair, flowing, and skilled in terms of play as we possibly can? So that's potentially something to talk about. Maybe you don't have to, which is great. You're, you're living the dream. So I love it. Um, I hope that helps. Having that pre-match chat, I think, really will help get you on the same page. If you're bored of doing pre-match chats with anybody, try to make it fun. Think of, you know, different ways. Use slang, swear a lot, make jokes. I don't know, whatever it is, whatever your style is, that just developing that rapport and saying hi and, and committing to doing something together is going to make a massive difference out on the pitch. And I know it seems stupid, but trust me, try it. It's going to work. Okay. Jenks, good to see you, buddy. I'm glad you could join in. So that is two. Oh, here's a picture of a pre-match chat. And this looks like an outdoor one. So I think this is the one that I've linked to. So if you want to take a look at it, go ahead. If you have any suggestions as to ways I could improve this card, perhaps make it A2 format for my UK friends. I could do that. Word, word can do that sort of thing. <laughs> okay, Martin, I'm going to bite on this one because it's really good. Here you are. Uh, it seems that you're suggesting I should drag myself away from the bar, arrive before bully off time and talk to my colleague. Huh. Look, man, I'm not the boss of you. You do what you will. You do what you will. I'm just throwing out crazy ideas. I just, you never know what, what could possibly happen if you do this. And remember, the bar is a great place to go with your colleague after the game and congratulate each other on all the great stuff that you did during the game. That would be my advice there. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Remember, if you have your question, put it in the chat and I would love to talk to you. Ian, very good to see you, buddy. Yes, it is nice to be back live. Um, actually, another reason I wanted to do this was to try to keep these skills sharp because it's one thing to do recorded videos where I've really thoroughly prepared a script. And then you see me in real life where I stumble over my words a lot and don't articulate and stop myself from swearing all the time. So there you go. 
<laughs> and there's Liam giving some banter back. We are lucky if you arrive before pushback. There he is. Nailed it. Flames. Hi, Stephen. Stephen is my birthday buddy. We have a birthday on the same day, and I remember that very well. Okay. Third question. Here we go. <laughs> This is off Instagram, Gopi or Gopi Hockey. I'm not sure how to pronounce it properly. Uh, would like to know which whistle do I suggest for umpires? I am so glad you asked because I have very strong opinions about whistles. I know, right? It seems dumb, but I really do. Because for me, at almost every level of play, there is only one whistle and it's this one. Not necessarily my logo. It's just, I had a really pretty picture of it. But if you want to buy one from me, you can buy one from me. I'm not going to be mad. But this is the one here. Fox 40 Classic. Fox 40 Classic. Okay. It is the tone of whistle that we hear in almost all of our games. And I've had umpires be like, hey, I got this really new cool storm or mm, I really like the mini. It's so cute. Or they've got some other brand and like, it's okay. But think about what the purpose is of you blowing your whistle. It's to communicate. And when you blow a whistle that sounds different from what players and coaches and fans are accustomed to, you are going to shock the crap out of them. And they're going to wonder, what, what, what is that? What? Are they mad? Are they happy? What's going on here? Okay. Don't be a rebel on this. This is the one place where you want the tone of your whistle and the way that you blow it and the length of your blows and the, and, and the sharpness, the intonation. You want that to be doing the speaking, not for people to be wondering what the heck that thing is that you're using in that particular game. Miss whistle modulation. Very true, Valley. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Jenks. Glad to have you there to backing me up on this. Don't tell Harrison because he's going to come in and be like, mini, mini, mini. I don't hear it. <laughs> so sorry, I'm laughing at Martin saying he'd come early just to talk to me, but he wouldn't come early for any of his other colleagues, which that's fair. Okay. So Fox 40 whistles. Now it's Fox 40 classics. The times that you would vary from this, and I this brings me to a related question. This is Andy Waller, I believe. Um, he asked me quite a while ago, I guess, but I save up all these questions for rainy days like this. Uh, if you have two whistles in your hands, like why do umpires have two whistles in their hands or they have two Fox 40s with different tones? Why? Okay, so during a game, you shouldn't change between different whistle types again, because you're going to confuse the heck out of the people who need to be focusing on putting the little ball into the big white box. But if there was an emergency, if for example, you started calling a game and right next to you, there's another pitch where there's another game going on and they're also using Fox 40 classics and the players approach you don't assume because actually players are smarter than we think. And they can sometimes discern the directionality from which whistles are being blown. And they know what is applying to them and what isn't applying to a different game. But if the players come to you and approach you and say, look, we can't distinguish those, your, your whistles. Do you have something else? Then you will. Okay. That's probably going to happen at a quarter or halftime break, depending on how you're playing. Matt Bowen. Yes. Fox 40 classical day long. I like it. So, you are going to want to try to stick with that one whistle. Now, I've noticed this trend with the umpires uh, at the top levels all carrying multiple whistles. And I've had one or two of them tell me it's because they're there in case a whistle breaks. Never had a whistle break on me. Not once, not ever. These things, like, what are you doing to them? I, I don't understand. My habit, my practice has always been to actually put one of my product placement uh, FHU pens, which is like a little, like half of this, not even, even shorter than that, just, just this long of a pen. It's on uh, a D-ring 
and I connect that to my whistle. That is what I hold when I need something to grab onto to, to, to make it easier for me to, to blow my whistle. I've seen some umpires with nothing to hold onto, and I'm like, you are brave. I would drop that whistle without a doubt. Like, so the pen helps me give me something to hold on to. And then coincidentally, I can then pull out the pen and I can then write on my hand, write on my face, whatever the information is that I need to write at that time, the goal, the card, whatever information I'm looking for. And I don't have to fumble around in my pockets because again, I'm clumsy. Let's not make this any harder than it needs to be. So I think what those umpires are doing more so is just, it gives them something else to hold on to that also serves as a backup that they probably won't need. Don't know. But yes, you don't want to use different whistles in the same game unless you absolutely have to because of confusion. Um, and just back to Fox 40 Classics, um, there have been some situations I've noticed in pro league games and things like that in very noisy stadiums. If you're playing in, say, Odisha or you're playing uh, in Buenos Aires, you might have enough crowd noise where you want to use their uh, using a different brand and a different model uh, in that product line, which has a higher decibel level, but it is not as responsive to modulation as Valley put it earlier. So unless you're in a noisy stadium with 25,000 fans in it, I think you're going to be okay with the Fox 40 classic. I believe it in my heart, in my heart somewhere in here. All right. Um, I hope that answers all of the whistle questions. Let's see. Uh, James is going to make me go back to something. James, you are a detail freak. I love it. Usually. Okay. I have to unlock my iPad. This is crazy. Okay. So he, he wants to go, <laughs> he wants to go back to on the 12.4 rule clarification about discarded equipment of probable goals. I take it from the context about offenses by defenders that we are only talking about defenders equipment here. Ball strikes and attackers equipment and prevents a call. It should be play on under 11.8. Yeah, it should. Because the attackers disadvantage themselves. Excellent. Nailed it. Okay. Look, I can even flip back and forth. I just had to remind myself I could do that when I'm not talking about something that we're showing. All right. What other feedback am I getting here? Ian had something. Yes, he's talking about when there are two pitches right next to each other. Exactly, right? And, oh, netball. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Sorry. Not a sport. Just kidding. If you're a netball player, sorry. Anyway, uh, and Ian mentioned that this is why I should be able to double click on that to bring it back in. Anyway, uh, that he has a spare whistle in his pocket rather than on the same little lanyard. That's a very good point, Ian. What's the point of having a whole bunch of whistles in your hand that are all connected together? Because if you drop that thing, <laughs> they're all gone. So I've never thought that I would need to have a whistle in my pocket to save me because as soon as you drop your whistle, the first thing you do is go and pick it up. You're not like, I don't need that. I'm going to get my backup. No, you're, you're going to grab your other whistle because you're terrified somebody's going to step on it and put their shoe germs all over it. Ugh, gross. Okay. Neil is telling us two Fox 40 classics attached to a mini carabiner. Do you know how long it took me to say that word properly as an adult? Like it was literally last week. And the second is pretty much for holding on to. There you go. So that is where you're at. Oh, wait, wait. I have totally lost my place with all these things. I've gone to the wrong app, right? It's fun. It's fun. Okay. I think we've exhausted whistles and that was good. We're at 35 minutes. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's go to a question that I got from two people. Doop, doop. Ha! So proud. So would you ever consider not awarding a penalty corner? And this is coming from our friend Jim Butler. 
Would you not award a PC when the ball hits the foot, not dangerously, of a defender in the D? Okay. So I think we're all very well aware that we all know that not every foot is a foul. And by matter of principle, we know that not every foot in the circle is a foul. The tricky thing is, is that we have quite a bit in the way of cultural expectations about those being called. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little story that um, that Soledad shared with me. And I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, we didn't talk about it on the broadcast, but we talked about in our preparation. And I'm sure she won't mind me sharing it because this was in the early days of video referral. And it's actually not about her, really. It's about Carolina De La Fuente. So, Carol, I hope you're fine with this. Um, but it, because it was early days of referral, I think we can all agree that we were all learning about these things at the time. So it's all good. But yes, very early on, uh, Carol was at a tournament and there was a foot inside her circle, which she clearly saw. And she made a great demonstration. No, play on. She was not going to award the penalty corner for it because nobody was disadvantaged by it. The attacking team, of course, being not dumb, went up to referral on it. And that put the video umpire in the situation where they hadn't really explored the concepts of advantage or disadvantage. And they had to make the call and they had to send down the information that they were recommending a penalty corner. Carol gets this information and according to Soledad, says, nope, still not giving it because there was no disadvantage, free hit. <laughs> that may not have gone over great with the umpire managers. We know that that was probably the correct call, but this is the tension that has developed now because we've implemented at the top levels, this highly technical black and white way of looking at the game how do we balance that with what we understand as actually being significant to the game? That's really, really hard. And I have seen many instances, sorry, I won't say many, I've seen a few instances on video referral where a subjective question about whether advantage was properly played instead of the penalty corner being awarded, for example, the recommendation has come back from the video umpire where they have, they have uh, upheld the pitch umpire's decision that the advantage was good. I've seen it the other way as well, where it said, actually, that advantage wasn't good. So it's a developing area, but the knock-on effect for all of us umpiring at lower levels is that how do we deal with that? So now that story time is over, let me go to a couple things here. Um, so in a compressed space like the circle, what you're going to find generally is that it is more likely that a disadvantage does occur because there's probably a lot of people around. So keep that in mind first. Okay. Um, and just following up. So this came from, um, this came from Philip Hills in Facebook, also looking for specifically for some reason, I don't have my pen working. Um, maybe if a shot is going wide uh, and strikes it in front of it and def can continues to go wide, should we be awarding a PC? The closer you are to the end line, the closer that defender is to the end line, when it hit their foot and then proceeded to continue off that end line, the more likely you're going to be able to sell your assessment that no disadvantage occurred. The further up you get, or the more crowded it is, or if there is anybody remotely possibly getting in behind that defender, you're going to need to call that penalty corner. But here's the thing. Whichever way you go with it, sell it. Okay, And I don't mean sell a bill of goods. I mean believe and convey and communicate strongly why you've made that decision. Don't just put your hand up for the 23 meter restart because that's the correct decision. The last touch was unintentionally off a defender off the end line in this kind of scenario. 
Don't just give your signal and don't say anything. Do something very dramatic. Like, nope, not a foul. That's going to be up at the 23, please. And whatever verbiage you'd like to use, but make it really, really clear why you're not awarding that penalty corner. And if the attackers aren't happy about that, what you're going to say is you weren't disadvantaged. And trust me, it's going to go both ways every time I'm on the pitch. Okay, so it's about imparting onto the players that, yeah, maybe the attackers were expecting that call in that case, but you, the, you are going to apply this standard all the time. And I think in the long run, that will gain you more respect from the players than if you were giving cheap corners, as it were. Especially because we're in the situation where we have these really long-term relationships with the players in our local areas. You know, we might be umpiring the same people for 10, 15, 20 years. I'm going on 30 years with some people umpiring them still. And, you know, that, that kind of knowledge and trust builds up over time. So it is still good to do the right thing. But make sure that this is a really clear situation for you. Okay. Jenks, you're you're talking good sense here. Let me bring my window back into focus so I can put this back. I don't know if I what's going on here, but Jenks is just saying here that uh, I almost sound English with uh, what I'm saying, and of course I do. I spent six years umpiring the National League, and those experiences were scarring. No, I'm just kidding. They were very formative. And I learned so much from all my colleagues, including Jenks, but many, many others as well. Um, and really helped develop my understanding of the game. So, you know, kudos to you, Jenks, and all of the English people and other UK residents that I dealt with regularly when uh, I was with the MPUA. So thanks, you guys. Jim, great stuff, Keely Crystal Clear. I'm so glad that you got to see me answer your question. That's really exciting. Okay, let me see. I have somehow lost the ability to make my Ecamm window big. This is really fun. I don't know what I did. Somebody asked me a question fast. I'm just kidding. I've got more to talk about, so I'm just gonna leave that. That was question four. We are at 143, whew. <laughs> Steven, only one game with you was not enough. That was really quite, quite sad. We should have had more, but that's how life goes. Now, let's move on. This is a really good question from my Welsh friend. Recently married, extremely talented. This guy can cook and bake like you would not believe. I don't know if he puts all that stuff on Instagram, but go check him out. Uh, Christian Phillips Adams. I think everybody calls him Crispy, but I haven't met him in person, so I don't use his nickname. So Christian is asking me, say in your game, you get a couple of decisions wrong and the player's attitude changes, indicating you're not on the same wavelength anymore. What techniques have you learned or tricks do you use to get back on track? Yeah, we've all had games like that where we come out of the gates and we think, yeah, I'm a good umpire. I've got this going. And people are looking at you like you have two heads. Uh, this happens a lot when you're in a new situation, obviously. Um, when players don't know you, coaches don't know you, the fans don't know you. You don't know the players either. Everything, there's a little bit of different style, maybe different communication things. This is why it's really valuable. And having just touched on the fact that I did spend those six seasons in England, that was one of the best things I learned out of that situation was I was brand new to all of the teams at all the levels that I umpired between all the different Bucks uh, games that I did, men's and women's, ones all the way through to threes, fours sometimes. Um, when I went through women's, at the time, it was, what were the levels? Anyway, I went through A and B and A and Prem, and then I did some men's stuff, and I was always getting thrown in with new people. And when I saw a team for the second time, I was like, hi, we're friends. 
and they didn't believe me. But being able to win people over when things aren't going well is a real skill. And it goes back again to what I was talking about in, I think, all of the answers to all the questions so far is communication. So I find one of the best ways to get myself out of a hole. And when you're having a tough game, and I'm not going to say a bad game, because what if you're getting everything right and people just don't believe you? The best way to get yourself out of it is to communicate with the players. Talk to them about what you're seeing. So I'm not talking about responding to criticism. I call that reactionary arguing. And I don't like that because it keeps you thinking about the past. And it really interferes with your ability to anticipate what's going to happen in the next phases of play. And that's going to make it less likely for you to make good calls. So what you want to be thinking about is that proactive communication and the evidence base, like no foul, that's good, that was five, you know, yeah, player, you're five meters away, uh, that sort of thing, that's out, that's still in, all those sort of little, this is what I'm seeing, instead of just an absence of a whistle and the absence of a signal can really help uh, get you back, you know, giving that evidence to the players of what is going up in this crazy little head of yours. Okay. There's the proactive communication about, Hey, when an aerial is landing, no, nope, that's blue ball. That's blue ball. Leave it, leave it. Now it's good. Warning players when you can see them chasing back on a tackle saying easy, easy, that sort of thing. Um, it gets you, connected to them, you're thinking about what information they need to hear from you. And you're helping the players, you know, listen to your headspace. Always, always good. Um, having little side conversations with players when you can. And I know it's really hard in tense games when you don't feel comfortable, but sometimes you can go to a player and you can just say something like, hey, great pass. That was a, that was a great, great play or you share a joke or something like that, just a tiny little thing to break the ice, you putting yourself out there and taking that risk of that first communication, it's, it's, like, it's like being in a bar and going to talk to somebody that you think is really cute. It's really risky, but really, what do you have to lose? You know, go for it, have, have a little chat. And that can just instantly humanize you just a little bit more to somebody who's closest to you is more, most likely gonna be arguing with you when you make a decision that they don't like. So that can really help. Um, let me deal with a few questions since things are, <laughs> that are coming up. Uh, Graham Woodcock would like to know if Crispy can uh, umpire as well as bake. I don't know, he hasn't sent me any tape yet. I think he can, that's just me. Oh, and there it is. He's on the broadcast. Glad you're here. Um, James, your question, following on from that, should we then adapt to different players at different levels and different geographical competitions, expecting different things? In Canada, this is how they say the rule should be applied, might not be convincing halfway across the world if you're the only umpire in the league calling it that way. Yeah, that's a good question because we come to this in a lot of the online social media conversations that we have about rules interpretations. And um, you know, James, we had this when we were talking about the, uh, about, I think it was the danger and a player, a defender, a player in the defensive position, but playing a free hit from within their circle. And if they were to raise it in a dangerous manner and cause danger to a player on the opposite team who is outside the circle, where would you take the free hit? And you were telling me that on exam, they told you it was a penalty corner. And I said, well, that's wrong. And I don't say that as a Canadian. I say that as an international hockey person with years, 15 years of international empire experience behind me and training to be an international empire manager. And I think what we need to get better at is acknowledging that there shouldn't be regional variations and rules and that we need to follow along international standards as best we can. Now, having said that, James, 
when you're talking about adapting to different levels, you're not adapting the rule necessarily to a different level, but the way you implement it will change for different levels because advantage is different, because danger is different. Flow needs to be different. Pace, skill, all those things are different. And your ability to adapt what you think would be dangerous if I implemented the same standard in an international match, what I thought danger was, and then come back and do an under 12 game or a high school game in Calgary with a bunch of players who just picked up a stick for the first time last week, I would be absolutely, I, I would be paying a disservice to that game. So yes, the calls are gonna be different, but that's not inconsistent. That's consistent with the spirit and what is needed in that particular game. Okay, so there is a difference there. And I hope that for people who are in charge of regional associations, people who are leaders in their local areas and their local leagues, have a think about are there ways that you can access resources of people who are maybe at a bit higher levels, you know, up from you to continue to funnel correct current information down to your level. I think that's really, really important. Now, it's interesting in hockey, and I've really noticed this uh, over the course of the shutdown, and this is probably going to conclude everything I talk about today because I can see I'm already coming up to an hour. But what I've noticed is that there is, um, I've been taking part in lots of coaching online things because I'm a really, really terrible coach, and I need to get better. But I also am trying to figure out how coaches think and how they work. And there's a lot of room in coaching and playing for different approaches. There's not necessarily one correct way to hit the ball. And even if Rick Charlesworth came up and said, this is the correct way to hit the ball. You know what? If Siggy Aikman came up and also demonstrated the correct way to hit the ball, and it was very different from Rick Charlesworth, I'd say, hey, those are probably both correct. Those are very valid ways to look at hitting the ball. And it might work better for some players than other players. There's no correct way to press. There's no correct way to, to transition defense. There's no correct way to run a penalty corner. But in umpiring, we need to be better at acknowledging that there is a more correct, better way to call the game. And it does have to flow hierarchically. And it, it seems like, I don't know, kind of sounds like a power trip. And I feel really awkward right now talking to myself like this. But what we're looking for is consistency. It's okay if Jamie Dwyer hits the ball extremely differently from, uh, from Carla Rebecca. They have completely different skill styles. That doesn't affect anybody. It makes them better in who they are. But if umpires are going out there and doing different things in one region to another, then you have problems. And it's a problem for the umpires. It's a problem for the players. Because as soon as they get outside their little bubble where everything's called in a certain way, then you get into messes. Because the expectations carry, well, that's wrong and that's right. And then you get into these fights that you can't win. Well, the way you win it is to be like, what are they doing at the top? What is the international standard? And then you apply that international standard to skill and pace and age and experience and all those things that you find at all the levels of the game. That was a very long answer to that question. I hope it helps. Simon, it was good to see you. Thanks for sticking around as long as you did. Obviously, uh, that was great. I do have a few more questions, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save them up for the next uh, What Up Wednesday, which will happen next Wednesday. But also before I do, I just want you to know that I'm not gonna do this every single Wednesday because there's something else that I'm gonna be doing on July 29th. Did it work? Okay, good. Um, on that particular Wednesday, at this same very time, I am going to be doing my very first webinar workshop. So 
Um, these are quite um, pushy, <laughs> wrong word, but very one-sided in that you know, I try to solicit as much feedback as I can from you guys, but really this is, you know, me talking and, and a lot of listening going on on your end. Thank you. But this webinar on positioning is very much going to be interactive. I will be breaking you into discussion groups. I am going to be giving you tasks and challenges. There are worksheets involved. I will expect you to feedback to me and you challenge me during the session because this is going to be a deep dive like you have never seen a deep dive into positioning. This is not going to be just drawing little pictures. I am going to show you examples of different styles of employing the new positioning. What are the pros and cons of it? What kind of skills do you need? Physical skills do you need to be able to employ it? How can you practice it? All kinds of incredible information that I've been working on. I've been obsessed with positioning for the last four years. And I am really looking forward to being able to share a lot of the thoughts that I have had with you. And I will be pushing the envelope a little bit. So I hope you're interested in that. Come join me if you are. It's going to be July 29th at this very time. So I don't know where you live. You tell me. It could be 8 p.m. It could be 9 p.m. It could be one o'clock in the afternoon, whatever it is, you can go to fhempires.com forward slash webinar to get more details on that. Yeah, it is a paid uh, webinar, $20. I hope that's cool because Zoom costs money if you do the Zoom the way that I just do the Zoom. It's it's a thing. <laughs> Jenks is also looking for sponsorship. So yeah, we could probably work something out, buddy. You send, hit me up on the DMs and we'll figure something out. You're very welcome. I do hope it was useful. Um, and always, if you have things you want me to cover in the next WhatsApp Wednesday, I have really Tuesday, I've got Feature Friday. What am I doing with my life? I think I'm spending it on my computer. Uh, so lots of places that you can uh, send me questions and I'll figure out the best form in which I can answer them most thoroughly and most constructively for you. And if you have suggestions on different ways I can run this, I want to hear it. If you'd like to ask me some questions about the positioning webinar on the 29th, come at me. I'd love to hear it. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to reach out like this. This is the most conversation I have with people <laughs> in my life these days. So thanks for joining in. And uh, it was great to have you. Thanks, Stephen. I'm really glad that I got to see you as well. And we will see you next week on the next What's Up Wednesday. Ciao for now, friends. Bye.